great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Sarah Baskin. You mostly, Hi. you know me. I'm Mr. Hodge or Ben Hodge. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and checking this out and for submitting questions. Uh, Sarah Baskin is here uh, to talk to you a little bit about her journey, the craft, and as well as the business and to give her feedback based off of your questions. So, um, Sarah, is there anything you want to say starting off before we get into the questions? Uh, I just want to say that I'm so happy to be doing this and I am really open to any questions that come up um, and I'm happy to do another Q&A um, if more questions come up while we talk today. And I really believe in the arts, I really believe in the art of acting and, um, and I'm so excited that you guys do too. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, so like I said, we've uh, broken these questions down into three separate areas, the journey, the craft, as well as the business. And uh, we decided today that we're going to dive into the journey. It's a good place to start. Um, so I, Taylor, uh, one of my students, Taylor, uh, her first question was, when did you find out that you kind of first wanted to be an actor? And there's maybe a sub point to that, like, these are high schoolers asking these questions, obviously. They, they, wanted, they were asking, can you share a little bit about your start, maybe from when in high school, what was going through your mind as you were starting this process? Uh, so yeah, but how did you, when and what's your little acting journey that way? Um, hi, hi, Taylor. I'm waiting for Ben to come back. Okay. Um, so funny, talking on Zoom, you're like, where are you going? What's going on? Um, hi. Out. Yeah, uh, hi, Taylor, great question. Um, so I, that's it. I've gotten that question a lot. It's a, it's an interesting one for me because the process felt very organic. It wasn't like there was one moment where I was like, this is it. Um, I grew up in Montreal. Both of my parents are classical musicians. So I grew up in the arts, um, around the arts. Uh, I played a bunch of instruments. So I was really like, my whole upbringing was very artistic and in high school, maybe around 14 or 15, I started taking acting classes. I got interested in it, not in any serious way. I just thought it was more fun than music, to be honest. I was like, ooh, talking, yay. Um, and then when I, I did a play when I was 16, A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, I played Hermia, and it was a really powerful experience for me. And, it, and that's when I started to get not more serious, but just more uh, intentional with the fact that this was something that I really wanted to be doing um, as much as possible. Um, and so that continued for the rest of high school. And then uh, I decided not to go to a conservatory for college. Um, I, it was a, an interesting decision that I gave a lot of thought to. Um, but I felt like because I was interested in um, acting in plays and at the time, time just plays as opposed to musical theater, you don't need to get conservatory trained uh, if you're interested in doing plays or TV and film. It's not quite uh, as necessary um, in the same way. So I really wanted to get an education and a liberal arts education and brought in my way of thinking. Um, so I ended up going to Vassar College for college, um, but I majored in theater. I still acted all throughout college. Oh, sorry, my phone is still on. Um, I'll turn that off between questions. Um, and then in, in college, this is a long answer to your question. I hope it's helpful. Um, I felt like before I entered the workforce as an actor, I wanted to get real training, so I, applied to MFA programs and got into the American Repertory Theater at Harvard, which was a joint pro program at the time with Moscow Art Theater. And so I went straight from undergrad to graduate school, um, which for me was really powerful and really uh, helpful and I got amazing training. Um, I don't think you need to take that journey. I think everyone's journey is really different, but um, there's no one way to become a professional actor you don't need to get conservatory training at 18. Um, some I have some actor friends who never had that kind of formal training and I have some who went to conservatory very young and some who had a similar path to mine and there's just so many ways there. 
Yeah, there, that's a really great uh, thing that I've heard a lot from, and, and it's a question I get often uh, too, and I'm so glad that you can speak to that. So to hear you say that, because I'm saying that, to, that there's no one way and some uh, I've heard differing things. So um, I, I think I did like what you said about, um, you, you had mentioned about what was it like going to um, a liberal arts school um, versus I've heard some differences about some, because a lot of, a lot of the uh, actors in, in, at Central here will probably end up in a liberal arts school. Some might go, and it's great, right, and I've told them that, like, that's fantastic. Go, do that. Study whatever you want to study and pursue, you can do that. So to hear from you that that is something that is possible <laughs> is, is also really important. It was my path. I actually am a pretty firm believer in getting a I'm going to turn off my phone. I don't know why I'm so popular, but I'm going to turn off my phone. Um, so, um, I am a pretty firm believer in getting a liberal arts education, if that's something that interests you. Um, if it's not, then take that path. But the fact is, um, when you're, you know, without wanting to sound at all uh, condescending or anything like that, when you're, you know, 16, 17, 18, making that decision, it's still very, very young. And you might change your mind when you're 28 and, or 27. And, and it's really much easier if you've had um, a, an education that is not conservatory trained. You, you actually broaden your options uh, to change your mind and now more than ever people have career changes or they do slightly different things They become drama therapists like there's so many options yeah. and you just don't know how your own creativity is going to change and expand and shift as you get um, Older, so I think it's helpful. I have a friend who went to Vassar with me uh, was a little younger than me and he wanted to drop out he was like I'm an actor I'm gonna drop out and me and I think my dad ended up getting on the phone with him and I was like, I really don't think you should. Like you're a, you're a junior in college, just finish it out, finish it out. He ended up staying uh, for the rest of his time at Vassar. And then he ended up going, getting an MFA from NYU in acting, which is an excellent program. And then he decided the life of an actor wasn't for him. And now he's getting a master's in some like, something political. He wants to work in politics. And had he, that's a really, he had a beautiful path. He worked professionally. It was just, you know, he was just following what felt right to him. Because a lot of people love acting, but don't love the lifestyle of being an actor. So, right. you, and you don't know whether you're going to like it till you're in it. So had he n dropped out of college, that he wouldn't have had that option. You know, and so I just think that I also, and that's the very practical explanation. I think in a, um, in a more, um, the less practical explanation is it's really fun to take a class in psychology, to take a class in, uh, to take a bunch of classes in the English department. Like it's really fun to be able to just broaden your horizons as a human being. Yeah, and I think something you just said, I just wrote it down, I love it. You don't know if you'd like it until you're in it. I think that's just a fantastic follow up that I want to just drive home is, is that, you know, because you won't know if you like the acting grind until you, you're, you're really doing it. Um, yeah. and, and I think uh, that's the scary unknown part of life is that you don't know. And I often say, too, well, you could go become a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher and discover the same exact thing that I don't like this. I had a I had a teach, I had a friend that that was in the teaching um program and got, loved it loved it all the way up to student teaching and then got into student teaching and was like I I, I hate this I can't do it mm -hmm. and you know so again like it's it's I I, I like that I want to kind of push back on that stigma that that uh you know acting is this you know yes it's hard but it's no really it's just as hard as anything else that you do you know so I mean I think the easiest way to uh know if you want to keep being in the acting profession is if you enjoy it as much as the struggle like basically with anything in life there's going to be some struggle in the pursuit of whatever you're doing and there's going to be some really enjoyable parts to it and you just want to make sure that they are equal if not the the enjoyable part is a little bit more if it's too imbalanced it's not worth it right process really is everything it's about enjoying the process of doing the thing that you're doing 
Um, yeah, I think that's a, um, Maddie asked a question about that kind of ties in, uh, in line with that. Maddie asked a question, what has been your favorite and your least favorite part about the acting journey? Um, and maybe what is what moment, what is one moment that kind of stuck out with you and made you the actor you are today? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. My favorite and least favorite moment of my acting journey and something that stuck out made me the actor that I am today. Mm. God, there's so many things that have stuck out that I feel like have made me quote unquote the actor that I am today. Uh, I feel like anytime, anytime there's a bump in the road and you move through it, you get stronger on the other side. Um, so one of my favorite moments in my acting journey, that's so hard. Uh, I'll start with my least favorite because those are a little bit uh, easier. Um, I, landed in New York and realized that I have a really strong fear of rejection. Like I find I've had a real journey with learning how to audition and put myself out there. Um, part of what I think has made me a good teacher is that I have had to work through so much stuff to just be able to keep putting myself out there, keep auditioning. So I, uh, one of the hardest moments for me was when I, um, Oh my gosh, I was in this, my very first on-camera job. I was very much a theater baby. I, I, when I went to get my MFA, I just wanted to be in avant-garde, interesting plays. And uh, then you, you, know, you land in New York and everyone's talking about TV and film and you're like, okay. And so my very first um, on-camera job was uh, this not so great TV film, which I won't mention. And, um, and the experience was so magical, but then when I saw the product, I thought it was so terrible and I felt so much shame. I couldn't believe I was a part of it. And um, it was really hard. And I don't even know, it was hard for so many reasons. It was hard because it felt hyped up. Uh, everyone kept saying like, this is gonna really change things for you. And then it didn't change anything. I just saw myself in this bad thing. <laughs> and that happens a lot. There's a lot of talk around things. There's a lot of hype and, um, I also realized that so much of how things turn out is out of your control. Yeah. Like if, if the thing, if the project is good, is out of your control. If people like it, is out of your control. There's just so much that is not in your control. So you have to have a sense of letting go, a sense of surrender. Yeah. Um, that it was really hard. I don't even know if I'm explaining it well, but I felt so much shame when I saw myself in this. Uh, TV film and I and I felt like an over overwhelming sense of embarrassment when in all honesty people probably watched it thought it was not so great and then forgot about it like no one is ever thinking about you as much as you were thinking about you right but I think that learning the lesson of like learning the lesson that process is everything mm. I enjoyed shooting it I learned a lot it was a great experience there were aspects of it that didn't turn out how I wanted and it doesn't matter, you keep going. But I remember feeling just so let down. Um, so that's one moment that really sticks out. Yeah, that's gotta be crazy. I mean, it's an interesting concept you mentioned about, you know, rejection, you know, and self-worth and, and the feeling of am I good enough, which I will say 100% is, is where, uh, I'm gonna call out the acting classes here on this in a good way, this is a good way. We all, I mean, most of them, 90% of them deal with some sort of that rejection. I'm afraid of what people are gonna think of me. I'm afraid of if I go for this or if I push this or if I allow myself to feel or play this role or character or feel this feeling, people will change their perspective of, of me and I won't go. I can only imagine what that is also now like with you adding into this the hype of like things not like ex your expectation of it being something and then going through it and then not having it follow through oh my word that must be yeah, yeah it's just an extra layer of i didn't it's not i'm definitely not good enough um so yeah it's a really important thing i mean i have so a lot to add to that that i think that it's 100% human to have a fear of rejection. Yeah. I think most people 
have a version of that fear. Um, it's just that people deal with it differently. Some people, you know, they have the fear and then they hide. They just don't put themselves out there. They don't go for it. Some people have the fear, but they just do it anyway. They just have a higher tolerance for the upset that is the vulnerability of feeling rejected, right? So I think how you learn to deal with that as an actor will make or break whether you can stay in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing about the disappointment is I was thinking of what a meditation teacher, a friend of mine used to say, or probably still sa says, which is that you have to have an appointment in order to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So disappointment comes from having a, an expectation of how something is going to go, which is also so human, right? We have an expectation of how um, how that audition is going to go, how the scene's going to go. And if it doesn't meet our expectation, we feel disappointed. Now, the opposite of that would be to do our best to let go of expectations and just be as present with the process and the experience of what we're doing. Yep. That's fantastic. So um, if, yeah. Can I just transfer that to acting? If you go in to do a scene and you're like, I really want to get very emotional at this point and then I want to cry and I want everyone to be so moved by my performance and then it's going to be blah, 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 blah. like you have all of these set uh, expectations these set appointments about how things are going to go and what you're actually cutting off is what might appear now planning is what the human brain does best it's what we as humans we're like I'm going to have a plan and I'm going to execute it and then everything's going to be great right and what we actually have to be brave enough to do is let go of our beautiful little plan and just arrive in the now, arrive in the moment and let the journey take us both in our acting and also in our life. And if there's one thing that's happening right now with the, what's going on globally is our appointments have all been canceled, right? No one would make the appointment that is happening right now. So we have to let go and just, let the journey take us and be as open and in flow with what's happening as possible. Well, that I that is beautifully said, and I I that I just love everything about that, uh, particularly about the letting go and just the appointments and the I've never thought of it that way, and I and I think that that's going to be. I just think it's a fascinating way to look at things when that planning and control that we expect things to happen in a scene or in a moment, um, you're, you're screwed when, when that starts to happen in the acting. Uh, and I think these, uh, these actors have experienced that they, they, they know what that feels like. So I, your, your comments there are fantastic with that. Um, um can I just add, cause I didn't quite get to all of um, sure. the oh. questions. Um, the reason that first one sticks out to me is that I was quite uh, young and new to it. And one thing that a lot of actors get into is they keep trying to arrive. I'm going to get that one job that's going to make me get to the place. I'm going to get that one experience and then you know, I'm going to figure out how to act and then I'm never going to be bad again. <laughs> and I think that, that the reason I was so upset and disappointed is it was the first time I realized like you don't have that much control and there's no arrival. I've seen it from so many friends who've had like been you know series regulars on Broadway. The 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 disappointment from that comes even when you're having a huge career high is there's no there's no you haven't like arrived somewhere for good. You're in constant you're in a constant state of flux, and and just I know there's more questions, but I just want to say Maddie in terms of my favorite moments. Those are harder for me because I I've had so many beautiful moments and i think for me the the my favorites my highs are when i feel deeply engaged in a collaborative process um, i work on a lot of new plays i love working with writers in the room and there's a moment where something starts to come together and make sense and everyone can feel it it's almost like there's like an uplift and i love those moments so that sort of deeply collaborative moments uh, are have been i think my favorite my favorites fantastic um so we've talked a little bit about uh pearson taylor had asked a little bit about the biggest obstacle or fears so we talked a little bit about that um 
Zahar asked a really poignant question that I think fits with this. Have you ever thought about giving up or what can, what keeps you going when, when the business kind of, or when it was getting really tough? You kind of alluded to that at the beginning, but maybe mm-hmm. as that's changed throughout the rest of your, your journey a little bit, what keeps you going? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hello, Zahar. Um, of course I've thought about giving up. I think that's a very natural thing to think about. Uh, you know, I think there are these moments of recommitment. Uh, you, I, I thought about it a lot, I'd say about five plus years ago. Um, there would be moments where I'm like, that's it, I'm moving back to Canada. I can't with this, forget about it. Uh, and in those moments when you decide to recommit, you're re-engaging in a, in a renewed way with the thing that you love to do. So what keeps me going? Um, for me, teaching was a huge turning point. That was when I started teaching was a moment when I was really grappling with what it meant to be an actor. And it just felt like more painful than pleasurable. And I completely fell into teaching. Um, it literally fell in my lap. Um, that's another story. I won't get too tangential, but um, it fell in my lap. And I was like, okay, I'll give, I'll, I'll I'll teach a class. I did a little training with um, a woman named Emily Fletcher who was working yeah. for Tony. Do you know Emily? Yeah, we. Uh, she was uh, years ago. We. Uh, she was the first uh, acting trip that I took out with my kids several years ago. We went to uh, under St. Mark's and packed uh, eighty-five broke fire code kids into that under St. Mark's and worked with Emily. She's fantastic. Oh yeah. my God. Okay. So Emily, I was working for her part-time for her meditation company. Yeah. Um, and she was the one that was like, you should teach. And so she is the reason that I teach for Amy. That we fantastic. Do, thank you, Emily. Um, and um, wait, where was I going with that? Uh, well, I'm actually, I'm actually really interested. In, I mean, in terms of what kept, what kept you going when things were getting tough and you yeah. said teaching got you to that point. So I started teaching and it was this incredible moment where, and when I first started teaching, there were like three or four people in my class. No one knew who I was. Uh, no one cared. <laughs> and I used that time to figure out how to teach. So I was like, great, I have three or four people. Let's do this. And we would spend three to four hours and I would just figure out, you know, how to drop them in, how to tell the story, how to open us all up. And in that process, because so much of teaching is about, it's not about you, it's about responding to what you're seeing out there. And even in acting in a way, it's not about you, but you're still, your body and your expression is a part of it. So it feels more sensitive. Like it feels more like it's about you, but when you're teaching, it's, it's over there and you're just making it about other people. And so I ended up really falling back in love with the art of storytelling and with the art of acting. Yeah. Um, really. And I, that sounds like such a kitschy, cute thing to say, but I mean, and I didn't even realize it was happening, but I was like, God, it's so cool. Like it was just the self-expression. Um, when you teach, you help people ex- self-express through material in a way that's really profound. And so I felt like I re-engaged with, why I love acting and why I love storytelling. And it was a really deep experience for me. And then from there, I started re-engaging myself in that I, I love self-expressing through material. And I, you know, even when you bump up against your fears, your insecurities, I also love the, uh, the, cultivation of courage that it takes to meet that and keep going and so I think that's what keeps me going I don't know if that's clear and I don't even know it's very clear I think that's fantastic too and Mm -hmm. I I love how that kind of see I always I use the phrase seeing things from the other side of the table um in term in 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 this area and I've 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 witnessed uh, kids sometimes uh, actors in the program will come back and they will do assistant directing as seniors uh, because there's no other classes for them to take. And that's one of the things they talk about, where they, they even in the short four years of doing acting every year, um, you know, where they, they, they kind of, not only is it burned out, but they get to a point where they, they're, something's missing. And I said, come over to this side and see what you might, I think you'll like it. I think, and mm-hmm. many of them say the same thing, where they're like, wow, this is so cool in terms of like seeing this expression and the, watching these drops and, 
looking and really honing in on what someone's instinct and impulse it, it really helps their act our own acting when oh, that happens. Yeah. and it also increases um compassion yeah uh, because for compassion for others but also compassion for yourself because when you see uh, and I've also at this point had a lot of people who've come through my classes who are now teachers at AMAW. So I've seen them go from being just the actor, the student, to then the actor student who also teaches. And all of a sudden, you know, sometimes an actor does really good work or pretty good work or good enough work. And then when they're having their talk back, they're like, God, rah, 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 rah. and you just want to be like, it was fine. It's just, it's just acting. You did great. It's not a big deal. Might have not been like, you know, the best acting you've ever done in your life. But part of what throws us off is we're always trying to be so great, right? Yeah. And if you can let that go and just have an experience, which that, I mean, I try to say that to myself as much as possible. It's not always about like achieving excellence. What if you can just loosen that a little bit and just have an experience and do your best? And so I think teaching can soften the neurotic mind a little bit because you see when other people yeah. cut themselves out of their own experience just from all of their self-doubt afterwards um and then the other thing i'll say that keeps me going is just i love it i do love it i think it's a really powerful vulnerable art form um yeah that's really important to to love that um, it's one of the things that when we go out and work with Tony too, he's the same, he says the same thing before we even get into the acting, he, we, we talk about openly, like, what do you love? That's what you need. Like go for your heart, what you love. And if you do that, you'll be fine. There's no amount of money. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so anyways, that's a really good follow up for that for sure. Um, Olivia asked, um, I like this question a lot. What are some of the, what are, what's the biggest thing you wish somebody would have told you when you were first starting out? Or what's something you would maybe go back and tell yourself starting out maybe before that film that you got into <laughs> or beside like, it's okay. Like what's something you would tell yourself when you were, you wish you would have been told when you were starting out? <sighs> Such a good question. Uh, thank you, Olivia. Um, I think I have a couple answers. I'm a little verbose, I like to talk. Um, I think on the level of acting, I wish, this is a big wish, and I'm trying to phrase this in a way that's super respectful to all the wonderful teachers I had, um, in grad school, I personally wish that there had been more of an emphasis in acting training on the spontane spontaneity of the moment. Like, I wish hmm. that I had been told when I was starting out, you are enough. Hmm. And nothing will ever be more interesting than what's actually happening to you in the moment. Mm. I think that needs to be strengthened. I think you can learn a lot about storytelling, about going for things in terms of, you know, in MAW, we don't use the language of character, but just, you know, you can learn about story and going for things, but ultimately nothing is ever more interesting than an actor who's working from what they're actually feeling and experiencing in the moment. And I think I've worked so hard to strengthen that in me. And I immediately, when I landed in New York, got on that journey. I was like, oh, who's that teacher? And I wanted to find a way to be really alive in the moment. But I think you are enough. The moment is always the most interesting thing, always. And the third thing that I really wish that I had been told, this, and this is a little personal to me, but I hope it speaks to someone. I used to, I started having these theories when, um, when I started teaching that the people who auditioned best weren't always the most sensitive actors. Like they weren't always the ones that were like sensitive to the touch, but the ones who had a little bit more of a bulldog confident pres presence. Having this sort of like strong, I believe in myself quality when you're first auditioning is the most important thing. It's more important than talent, mm -hmm. especially when you're in your 20s. Um, mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm going to say this. Oh my God. But in general, from what I've noticed, 
And I've, a lot of actors have gone through my class at the, classes at this point. I've coached a lot of actors and auditions. Younger men, I know things are changing, but have a little bit easier of a time than women owning themselves in the audition room. I said it and it's what I believe. I <laughs> think things are changing and this is not true for everyone. But I have heard, you know, and I, I'm a little bit of like a research scientist for actors and artists. I pay attention, I listen to all the stories and there are, everyone has their own struggles with owning themselves in auditions. But a co just a couple of years ago, I heard the story of an actor I was working with and he told me about a, a, an audition he got where he started the scene and then he um, was like, I'm not really feeling it. Sorry, can I just do some stretching? And then he went to the back of the room and just did like, took a couple deep breaths, stretched his arms, and then came back and was like, thanks. And then he did the, the, the audition and he booked it. And I was so shocked. I've never, by the way, I don't recommend that. And it worked for him. I do not recommend that. I don't, it's not, you know, it feels like you're, it's just do that outside and come in ready to go. But the fact that he had the ownership to do it startled me i was startled i was upset actually i was like what never in a million years can i imagine pausing because i don't think it's going well stretching in the room in front of people even if i did that i would have so many thoughts about my stretches it wouldn't work like no and so the fact that he could take up that much space mm. and then audition was just it was unbelievable to me and so i i'm in a theater company um we're on a bit of a hiatus, but it's all women and it's a physical theater company. And so I posed that question to them and no one in the room could, could even fathom doing something like that. Um, I have friends. So in that room, then one of the women was like, I was recently a reader and couldn't believe the difference between how young men are able to own themselves versus young women. And the reason I'm saying this is we're in a time of immense change. I think that, um, women are being empowered to take up more space um, at a young age. And I think that, uh, that, you know, I think that's really fantastic. But um, the one thing I wish I could have told myself, because I really struggled with confidence and um, I, especially when I was younger, and I just wish I could have believed in myself no matter what. Was that too long winded? Oh, no, it was not. And, and you know, I'll call Olivia out here a little bit. That's exactly what Olivia needs to hear. Olivia, I wish that someone had told me, I wish I could have told myself, like, if I did a bad audition, you're great. If I did a good audition, you're great. No matter what, just believe in yourself. I always tried to make things perfect. I felt like I didn't deserve to get a job unless things were perfect. And that's so not true. And I just wish, I just, no matter what, I just could have had a little bit more self-belief and confidence uh yeah I'm and it really i'm starting to get a little emotional here yeah me too this that's is been... this is starting to happen through this digital media that that's exactly i mean knowing olivia i mean that's exactly what she needs to hear and it's not just olivia there are four or five six seven other people in that class that come in and and i've you know, there it's perfection and perfection and how do I be perfect and how do I know if I'm right? And there's a question on this paper that says, how do I know if it's the right, um, you know, Mal asks, how do I know if, if it's the right thing that I'm doing and I want to be so different from other people and- no, forget, Don't worry about being different. Just worry yeah. about being yourself. Yeah. Like you can't worry about being different. You can't worry about being perfect. I mean, I really, that question that Olivia, that question really, it actually upset me because I realized when I, you know, it's 2020, so over the holidays, I looked at all my, my past 10 years and I realized the biggest thing, I just never, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm having a better go recently with confidence, but I've worked through a lot, but I just never felt like I was good enough. I felt like I had to just be perfect in order to get anything. Um, hmm. And no amount of external affirmation, not getting an agent, not, um, you know, when I was in grad school, I got cast as the lead in the main stage show on the American Repertory Theater on their stage, which is unusual. And I spent the whole time not thinking I was good enough, like ruined experiences because I didn't believe in my acting enough. And now when I look back, I wish, even if I had been way worse than I was, I wish I'd believed in myself. Like, I think that's more important than actually being good. I think that you just, 
thinking that you deserve things and thinking and believing in yourself because you are you and there's no other you on planet earth. Mm. That's the gift I wish I could have given my younger self. Well, oh my word. Like I, uh, I think for today, I think that is a fantastic place to stop. And I, I hope and I pray and I, I, I hope you listen uh, to what Sarah has to say, y'all. Um, um, and I feel that I have been moved and it's opened me up to other things and, and connections and reconnections. And because even when I went out and worked this past summer, I haven't, I haven't acted in, I haven't gone to the other side of the table in, in years. And when I went out and was doing scene work, this, this, it, it comes back this whole idea of I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm just a teacher from York you know, nobody knows who I am, you know, but th that's that ego and that false sense of just like, just, I, I love what you said today, that it's not excellence. I would even maybe add, it's not your ego. It's not your, it's not your level in where you are versus everybody else. It's the experience of it. Oh, I just, Oh, I needed to hear that. And it's not. The ego is just trying to protect us. And it does it with, the ego is very unoriginal, right? Your thoughts, oh, I'm just a teacher from York. I don't know what yeah. I'm doing. It translates that to, oh, I'm just another girl in New York. Like, it doesn't matter what the thought is. The ego is very, mm -hmm. you know, very status quo, boring, unoriginal. And it's just trying to protect you from vulnerability. You know, yeah. it's just trying to protect you from opening yourself up. So you just, the best thing to do is just not let the thoughts get in the way of you doing it. I, I like to say, like, take your fear by the hand and walk hmm. and go. Well, um, I'm very excited for part two, where we can get into a little bit about the business and maybe some more craft questions. We had some questions about uh, the drops and schmacting and, uh, you know, all the permission and things of that nature. So um, I'm just so thankful. I, I hope that you found some uh, something from this, everybody, for watching. Sarah, I hope that you got something from it. Um, and I greatly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule uh, to uh, let us know. If, if people wanted to uh, find out more about you uh, in terms of, should they just check their, your website out or is there anything? Yeah. Uh, that's okay, cool. Totally. Um, I, I update it when I remember. <laughs> but yeah, or um, they can, if people have questions, just keep fielding them through you. Okay. Um, Fantastic. Well, uh, real excited. I, I thank you so much for doing this. And uh, thank you to the students uh, of class asking these great questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. That's kind of how it works with the flow of how I, I, it, I like to keep things flowing naturally. Um, and um, just fantastic. And I will say, uh, say hi to Emily when you see her. Um, I will. And same thing. And, um, and I will too as well. Um, but thank you so much for being here. And we'll find some time to get to part two soon enough. Awesome. Good luck on your audition. Break legs. You. Yes. All right. Be you. You are enough, yes. Miss Bass. Awesome. You are enough. <laughs> thank you. All right. See you Bye. later. Bye.